Okay, so uh, myofascial release, first of all, we abbreviate it MFR. Uh, you're going to hear MFR all the time, and you're going to chart MFR. So MFR stands for myofascial release. Um, this is a technique that we use a lot if you're going to work on any kind of uh, conditions of pain, any kind of conditions aggravated by posture, uh, repetitive patterns. You know, you work with athletes, musicians, uh, couch potatoes, uh, people who are just uh, all kind of injury. So it's really helpful for a lot of conditions. Um, it is also considered a type of stretching. Uh, so uh, when we learn trigger points next, and we learn that after you treat a trigger point, it stays away better if you use heat and stretching. That stretching could be any kind of stretching, including myofascial release or pin and stretch or passive stretching, active stretch, stretching, et cetera. So a lot of options there for you. Um, this first picture, I just love it. Uh, this is a picture of, um, you know, this uh, kind of pink uh, or reddish or terracotta kind of color, it, our muscle fibers. And then this kind of like shiny, whiter uh, kind of material is, you know, the fascia. And so, you know, as you started to study in your homework, you know, the arrangement of the muscles, all the different layers have fascia surrounding them. From the smallest microscopic structure wrapped in fascia, bundling those together, wrapping them in fascia, bundling those together, wrapping them in fascia and connecting it all with fascia. And that's just the fascia around muscles. We also have fascia between all structures. So. Uh, this, I think, is beautiful that you can see this. And if any of you cook with raw meat, uh, you know, you can, you can play with your raw meat uh, before you cook it and really see the fascial connections, right? Yep. The question the homework, I was a little confused about one thing. Is the periosteum considered fascia? Yeah, okay. great question. Uh, the periosteum, the living connective tissue layer around bone, is a uh, connective tissue. So, uh, you know, technically speaking, that is, a, that is a fascia. Yep. Now, sometimes when massage therapists talk about fascia, they're specifically talking about uh, the fascia only related to the muscle, right? Or you could look in a broader sense of all the connective tissues. Yeah, but it is, it is, I really think of it as fascia because, um, I mean, first of all, it's a connective tissue, but also the tendons uh, weave directly into it. So when we talk about tendons inserting on bone, that's how they insert in bone is that they actually weave in and become uh, connected to that periosteum that's attached to the bone. And we'll actually see like clinical implications of this. Like if somebody has uh, shin splints, which is very common with runners, and they have, uh, pretending like this is my uh, tibia, my shin bone, uh, the uh, connective tissue where the muscle, the tibialis anterior and other muscles attached to that bone, uh, they're tugging, 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 and so they're pulling on that uh, periosteum, uh, so that becomes part of the issue. They can literally pull uh, bone fragments right off of the tibia, uh, you know, that can be part of uh, shin splints. All right, so um, we're gonna have a brief little bit of a history lesson here. Uh, and I will be calling out um, some folks that you should know um, that also you might get tested on. So massage therapists basically, uh, borrowed or developed from or took from uh, Rolfers. Uh, so MFR or myofascial release is a lot like Rolfing. It's not the same exact thing as Rolfing, uh, but it is where we got our MFR was from Rolfers. So we should know a little bit about Rolfing and Rolfers. First of all, Rolfing was developed by Ida Rolf. She's the founder of Rolfing initially. Um, Rolfing is a famous technique that is a structural 
uh, integration or structural balancing technique that's very good for anything related to posture. Somebody's phone won't stop and everybody keeps looking around for it. So I think people are highly irritated by this phone or at least curious if we could, if we could pause the phone or check it out, that'd be great. Um, so Ida Rolf, you should know Rolfing and, and Ida Rolf, this, uh, when it comes to the licensing exam, officially they've taken the history section off of the test, but they still do have, you know, some of the key uh, founders of different modalities and different modalities. So, you know, what you should know about Rolfing is that, you know, it's a structural technique, so it works with um, issues related to posture. It's very similar to myofascial release, but some key differences, it's also like deep tissue massage. Some key differences is that um, Rolfing traditionally works in a series of 10 treatments where they systematically go through the whole body with these techniques in order. So it's kind of like rebuilding the whole person because it's going through all of the fascia in the body in a particular order. It's famous for being sort of deep and intense. Um, and, you know, technically uh, there's a, a school that sort of split off from Rolfing. Uh, so structural integration, interestingly enough, is now the one that actually more closely aligns with Ida Rolf's work. Um, so there's, but they're very similar and people just usually say Rolfing. Uh, the other thing that you just might be curious about is that, you know, as a massage therapist, you're allowed to do myofascial release, but you're not allowed to do rolfing unless you become a rolfer. So rolfers, it's kind of a funny word to say repeatedly. Um, rolfers have to have a bachelor's degree and then do like a uh, more intensive study. Um, and the rolfing schools that I know of are in Colorado, but there may be more now. Yep. Bachelor's degree in Rolfing or a bachelor's degree in like physiology? Well, the last time I checked, it was just like a like a prerequisite. And so uh, you know, I don't honestly know. It's it's possible they've even changed it. Um, but I think it was a pretty open prerequisite. Yeah, but it's not in Rolfing. Yeah. Um, any other questions before we move on? Are the Practitioners just all over the place. This would be something I'd be interested in looking at. Yes, they are. I mean, this is a very famous technique. It's very well respected, and there's definitely rolfers in this area and also all over. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And that's that's Ida Rolf. Um, you know, she's a badass, you know, brilliant. You know, she's one of the grandmothers of, of some of our best body work. All right, so moving on, here's some awesome fascia pictures. Um, so some things we should know about fascia, right? It's this, uh, it's this connective tissue, right? There's different types of connective tissue. There's different types of fascia, but we most often think about the dense regular and the dense irregular types of fascia uh, or of connective tissue being fascia. Uh, but it can also be the ones that are kind of more of the packing material kind of connective tissue. Uh, like the reticular kind of tissue um, in our organs. Uh, fascia is constantly adapting and remodeling or changing. Um, and it changes in response to how we move. It changes in response to injuries. It changes in response to our posture. Um, and then the health of the uh, fascia, as well as how it responds, can change with things like how well we're hydrated, like if we have enough fluids, how much we stretch um, related to age. You know, oftentimes there's a decrease in the flexibility uh, with age, but of course there's big variables in that um, and, and injury. Um, I'm gonna talk you through a couple of these cool fascia pictures. Uh, on the top right, we are looking at this white part in the middle uh, is the sternum, this breastbone or chest bone. And then we have these fascial lines, these kind of streaky kind of whitish lines coming off of it. And you know, what I think is really interesting is like, look at this uh, side and this would be the right side of a human, but the left side as we're looking at it, 
look how many more of those fascial lines there are than on the corresponding uh, opposite side up here. And then down here, just the opposite, right? And so this looks like a handedness issue, possibly even somebody who plays a sport or a musical instrument that is using, you know, kind of a, a crosswise uh, movement pattern. So that's, I think it's a really cool picture because you can see that the fascia is literally thrown down in a pattern that supports the type of movements that uh, we do. Um, and so we all have this, right? This is a, a kind of a, a blatant example of this sort of uh, handedness that to me looks like maybe who's someone who like is, um, you know, throwing a, a football or, or serving uh, maybe a racquetball or, or volleyball or something like that. Does that bring up questions so far? And this is changeable, right? So like if this, if, if this human was to start to do, you know, start using their other hand just as much as what in whatever sport they were doing, uh, their body would then add, you know, this fascia more to the other side as well. Um, here we see, you know, this, this beautiful fascia as we peel away muscle layers, right? Uh, in, in a cut of meat, uh, this part of it would be called like the, the gristle. I'm sorry if that grosses anyone out. And then here we have some cross cuts, right? Like this, this would be, um, you know, a bone here in the center. And then we have all these kind of muscles around it, right? You can see this if you cook like different cuts, you know, like a, a, a rump roast or something, um, uh, and you can see the different muscle arrangements, but in between all the muscles, you know, you have these, these fascial areas separating them. And there's a particular organization of the body and of the muscles. So some muscles have more of these big fascial planes separating them and some have less. So an example is in the lower leg, there are big fascial planes separating the sections of muscle in the lower leg. And that can actually become an issue if somebody gets too much swelling in the lower leg, they can actually have an acute emergency situation called acute compartment syndrome, where uh, because there's these big fascial sheaths, if there's too much swelling, uh, there's not enough room. And they sometimes even have to cut surgically the fascia to release for some space. This is an acute situation. This is not to say that every time you have a swelling in your lower leg, it's a crisis, right? Because that's not the case, but yeah. So you mentioned uh, before that had the fascia is responsive, you know, to injury, to movement, change. Um, how often does it um, regenerate or reproduce? Yeah, that's a great question. I do not know the exact answer. My understanding is that it's like constantly remodeling and changing. So it's not use it or lose it, right? It does, it does use it or lose it to an extent, right? Like even our muscles, right, can atrophy pretty quickly. Uh, even let's say you're bedridden, even for the duration of a recovery of a surgery, uh, but then you can gain it back, right? And, but I don't know the exact number of days, like, uh, like for skin, right? It's like, it's a month basically, right? And, and for this, I don't know the exact number, but yeah. It can come and go. Yep, question I saw Taylor and then Mikas. Um, I'm kind of thinking as of like <laughs> a Venn diagram in terms of like figuring out like what fascia is. So is all fascia connective tissue, but not all connective tissue is fascia? Yes, that's right. Okay. And, and, you know, again, some people would only talk about like the uh, dense regular and dense irregular of like tendons, ligaments, and so forth as fascia. Some people would also, well, definitely would add the superficial fascia. So like the hypodermis, um, which is going to have our adipose tissue and our reticular. So those could all be called fascia. What the types of connective tissue that I've never heard people refer to as fascia is like blood or lymph, like our liquid. And I've never heard anyone refer to uh, bone, which is also a connective tissue as a fascia. Yeah, uh, great questions, yeah. Well, just going back on the- uh, Certainly. Procedure, oh, no, no, oh, yeah, the, yeah the, the, um, the lower leg, yeah. You're talking about how they uh, 
have to sometimes cut in acute emergencies. Yep. Uh, is that uh, is that what is called uh, bloodletting? Ah, interesting. Uh, yeah, no, that that's a, a little different. Um, yeah, this one would be actually cutting the fascia uh, to create space. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, I mentioned in our brief uh, introduction yesterday how, you know, poor posture, um, it can result basically in extra collagen fibers uh, and sticking structures together. So like your muscle fibers um, should be able to be independent of each other and your muscle fascicles should be able to be independent of each other and your muscles should be able to be independent of each other. Um, but every single one of those layers has fascia between it, which is has collagen and so forth. And that can get really sticky and so sometimes uh, separate, uh, separate structures can get stuck together. And so then they don't work as well, right? Because like, um, you know, each one should be able to contract and release. Every single fiber should be able to contract and release and contract and release. And then you take thousands of those, right? And then you take separate muscles. Um, but if we start connecting them together, you know, let's say a muscle in this direction is, is trying to pull my arm, but it's stuck to a muscle that does this, then the two get kind of stuck together. The two movements that otherwise could be more independent kind of get stuck together. So functionally, it's helpful to have these things separate. And an old injury can do that as well as a postural situation. Yes? This, um, is present and shoulder a set of tasks? Yeah, I mean, it certainly seems quite feasible that it is. I mean, it seems like that's probably going on. But the way that I've read about a uh, frozen shoulder is that the traditional medical model uh, talks about it a little bit in a little bit of an idiopathic way, a little bit, you know, unknown and mysterious. But it certainly seems that that would be part of what's going on. But I, um, I can't say for certain, yeah. Um, so, you know, here we have, uh, and, and, and so if you do stick these sub, uh, different um, types of muscle together that should be separate, um, all of a sudden you can limit your range of motion, right? Um, and our range of motion could get increasingly limited and we could also kind of back that up and, and free things up again. So here's a great example of a, of a uh, x-ray of a person in some pretty bad, but also pretty common posture at a keyboard or a phone. And, uh, you know, we'll do postural analysis a little bit later, but sort of a rough introduction and a basic concept here would be that, you know, a better posture for this person or an easier posture for this person anyway is if this head was up over the spine and exactly the ear hole, external auditory meatus, was exactly over the shoulder. And what that does is it puts the head in a better relationship to gravity and it's a lot less work for your body. Your head is like a small bowling ball in terms of size. And so if you were to imagine balancing a bowling ball on top of like a, a broom handle or something, you would need a lot to like pull it back, right? If it started falling forward. And so if our bowling ball heads fall forward, and I'm talking a small bowling ball, they're, they're only about like, <laughs> they're about eight, 10 pounds. I think people bowl with a lot heavier than that. But if we threw that, throw that forward, you know, we're adding uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 pounds of extra weight going forward in gravity. And so our muscles are having to kind of pull back desperately. And in that desperate pulling back, your body also is throwing down uh, extra collagen, extra connective tissue, as if it, your body was trying to like fix it with duct tape of like, holy shit, we got to we got to hold this balling ball up. Um, yes. Is this like what we were reading about in the chapter? Um, I can't remember his name, but it had to do with the triangles. The body's in different triangles and you have to balance 
if there's anything that's off, it pulls everything else off. It is, it is related to that yet. And I, I believe what you're uh, uh, alluding to is tensegrity mm -hmm. and uh, Buckminster and Fuller, mm -hmm. is that ringing a bell? Mm -hmm. So that kind of gets more into, yeah, how it's all related. Um, I'm very sorry, I'm gonna pause our recording. Um, yeah, the, the tensegrity concept is um, a little bit more about like the connections, um, but, but it, it's, it's related in that, um, you know, any, anything that we do kind of throw off balance, everything else has to compensate for. Uh, but the tensegrity model uh, is, yeah, let's get to that later. It's, it's actually kind of getting a little deeper than that. And this diagram is great, you know, um, because this is the pattern you see, uh, a pattern, this is exaggerated, but a pattern you see in a lot of our, our, our clients and ourselves. So what we call this part here is a forward head and when we have a forward head, we have a lot of shortness and tightness on these suboccipitals. Um, we also end up stretching here and shortening here anteriorly. What happens in, in compensation or in relationship is that we then often have a hyperkyphotic or an excessive curve in our upper back. And you can see that with this person. What happens also is that we tend to roll our forward, our shoulders forward. So we tend to medially rotate them as well as flex them um, in this whole hunching pattern. So all of, and, and think about whatever movement is happening. Those are the muscles that are especially short and tight. And those are the fascial areas that are especially short and tight. So if I roll things forward, I'm especially tight with everything up in here um, and extra fascia. Yep. Have you ever tried or know anything about those, you know, those things that you can wear that kind of like pull your shoulders back and help with posture? Yeah. With, you know, the effectiveness of, of those? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I've tried them a little bit. I mean, I think they are definitely great in theory. I mean, yeah. because the thing about the, the posture is that um, it really kind of takes time. So our fascial release is fantastic and it gives the opportunity for more movement and improved posture. But then of course, what a lot of clients do is like go back to their other patterns. So I think those kind of, you know, the postural uh, sort of assists that help you kind of pull back and whatnot. Uh, they can be really good reminders to kind of set new, patterns into play. I think if anybody was to sort of question or criticize, uh, do they work? It might be more around like you also have to train your own muscles right. to do it, right? But a lot of us, like when we're in this posture, a lot of us don't even know how to activate our middle and lower traps. And so even to be in this posture, right, we still have to activate those muscles, but it can kind of help us. Yeah, yeah, yes. I, I have this situation, but for other reasons that we've already talked about, but the, and I touched on this, but the rotatories and the multifidi yep. in my back uh -huh. are weak. Yeah. And then the, um, I'm just like losing my words, um, rhomboids and the, <laughs> just the individual big muscle. The traps um, are like overstretched. Uh huh. And then, of course, the pecs get really tight. Uh huh. And so it's like this pattern of breaking all that and then like making the rotatories and the multipedi stronger. Uh huh. And then um, pulling everything back. And then the other stuff won't be as hyper stretched. Uh huh. Too. Yep. And then uh, working out the pecs. Yep. Yep, and that's a super common pattern. Um, you're gonna see the majority of your clients have some kind of these postural imbalances. It might not be that exact one. It can also be like you throwing a, a hip 
uh, up or down, a shoulder up and down, a twist, you know, and we'll look a little bit later at bigger, you know, kind of postural assessment, but we're talking about almost all of our patients, right? Almost all of them have these different types of patterns going on. Like you could literally look at athletes all the way up to the Olympic level. And until you get to gold medal, you know, silver, bronze, even Olympic athletes have this shit going on, right? Except people at the Olympic training level, you know, they're watching videos of themselves and they have intensive trainers to like work out, you know, these, these issues. But, um, you know, even the most trained athletes have this. And I mentioned musicians the other day too, you know, especially professional musicians or anybody who's playing a lot, right? Um, that the different positions, right? I mean, any instrument will do it. Um, but whatever instrument you're holding a lot of, you know, you're, you're having to kind of brace yourself and throw down extra fascia in certain areas. Yeah. So a lot of our clients, right, will have pain and limited motion due to these things. And mm, very few of them talk about their posture. Some of them do. It depends like what kind of clientele you have. If you are working with like dancers they're very aware of it. And they're, you know, they tend to be like gymnasts, some of our most mobile, fluid, graceful, best posture patients in general. Um, but everybody else, you know, is, is um, maybe some of the folks that are super serious in the gym, right, um, are also kind of working with this. But a lot of your clients have these issues, but they're not saying, hey, I've got this postural issue. But instead, you're observing their postural issue while they're talking to you about what problems it's causing them. And so I'll mention this again when we do postural assessment, but kind of the trick is to observe them in their real habitat, right? Once you have them stand up and they know you're watching them walk or they know you're watching them sit up or whatever, they're gonna give you their best attempt, which is also always flawed. Like you're still gonna see like, they're twisted and turned and lifted and pulled and, but they're still going to kind of fake it for you. And so what you do is you're observing them from the moment that they walk in and you're observing when they get tired or relaxed, what is their posture, you know, that they're going to do when they're on their phone, what is their posture that they're going to do. Right. And once you start observing this, you can't stop observing it. Right. So you'll notice kind of in everybody in this room, Lucy can't not see it. Right. She, she's like thinking if, she was going to massage all of you, you know, where do you start, right? And you can start uh, just sitting, seeing how people sit, you can start um, that way. Or if you go to the mall, right, or any event where there's a lot of people, um, you'll see the way people walk, the way they sit, the way they hold themselves, um, the way they carry their kids, you know, you'll be like, oh, okay, I see, I see what's going on, yeah. Um, so again, we want to restore or increase range of motion and flexible, graceful movements. Um, I'll give an example of like, you could take your sort of average, not so active. I mean, I could say someone in their middle age, but these days I see with video games and whatnot, people can get this way even as a teenager <laughs> or even in their twenties. But let's just say somebody who's quite inactive, right? Um, who's on phone, TV, video games a lot. Um, they can get to the point where their fascias are so restricted and they're not moving enough that very little things can cause these kind of spasms, pains, things being thrown out of balance. Like, you know, even just like grabbing for a luggage in, in an airplane or grabbing for something off of the shelf or, you know, they kind of step funny when they're walking. And it can often be the difference between like, did that like recover with no big deal or did that become like a big, you know, a, a bigger um, issue? So um, we can really make a big difference. Um, so very, very basic. I mean, I'm going to show you this a lot more in lab. But the basic idea of a myofascial technique is that you're, I'll take one of my kind of muscle models here. We're talking about fascia, not just individual muscles. 
but you're taking the fascia, which is around the muscles. So you're often in a muscular area. Um, you're taking it to its stretch point and you're adding a little bit of a twist and you're experimenting like what direction does that twist want to go? And I'm exaggerating. This would be like little tiny, tiny movements. So rather than pulling exactly in a straight line, if you're holding it at its stretch point and you experiment with little twisting movements, you're going to find a particular twist and you never let go of the tension. So it's like playing tug of war. You don't let the other team win. So I've never let go of the tension. I'm keeping the tension. I'm adding a little twist and the magic ingredient here is time. So I'm talking about doing this for at least 30 seconds to several minutes. I've never let go of the tension and now it all starts to unwind. Now I'm exaggerating so you can see me this far, but as it unwinds, you're going further and further. Um, but it's never just straight line. There's always some kind of twist to it and you're following these patterns. But keep in mind that it's not just individual muscles, right? So like as you're following these stretch patterns and where there's resistance, you're often actually crossing over muscles, right? So like if I was to start in pec major, as I'm doing this, I could cross right over into pec, uh, into the anterior deltoid. I could cross right over my sternum. I could cross right over to the other side, right? So we're following the whole pattern of what's called unwinding. Is yes. The brain, kind of? Sometimes they follow the anatomy train. Sometimes they follow the band. Sometimes, you know, so sometimes you're following very intentionally those uh, structures. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're kind of just like playing with it organically. Like, where do you feel it like tight and bound or, or where, because of the way you see them sitting, do you see that, I mean, clearly, if I'm like this, I mean, obviously this is a bound up mess, right? So you don't even have to think like, which band is there or which train is there, right? You could also just start feeling into it and feeling into what opens that up. One of the first pictures that you showed and you said, oh, it could be a wrist or something, <clears throat> I think you said, and it showed the, um, like almost like a band. But that, I mean, would you call that a band of fascia where you can see it clearly on one side of the bone and then you saw it more dense on the other side of the bone? It looked like a perfect linear. Thing. So I was saying that was a sternum. Oh. And there was a movement on one side that was different from the other side. Oh, I missed the sternum part. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that like a band? Uh, it's a tight fascial pattern okay. there. Yep. Yep. Now, what I just described. <clears throat> is called direct MFR. So I'm taking it into its tight tightness and I'm taking it further in that direction. That's called direct. That's what most people do when they do MFR, but just as powerful and often needed is indirect, which is the exact same opposite. Instead of pulling into the tension point, you just create slack. And some people or some areas respond better to making slack. And then you kind of go into that. So, and of course, I'll show you this in lab. That's just a very basic. But one other thing I just want to introduce right from the get-go, because some people kind of misunderstand MFR in their hands, is that a lot of massage therapists, for some reason, maybe it was the way they were taught, start with the MFR just at the superficial level which is good to warm up tissue, right? And we're talking about superficial fascia, like right under the skin. I've heard one guy talk about this as like your skin bag. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, if that's the only MFR that you're doing, like that's just the superficial fascia. And a lot of clients don't like that feeling. And also you're only releasing the super fascia. Whereas what you can actually do is like, you can literally work the fascia as deep as the interosseous membrane, right? So we've got an ulna and a radius and between those two bones is fascia. So as we work through those layers, like you can literally get to the deepest fascia in the body. 
So um, not our first lab, but we'll get there. Yeah, questions, comments? All right. I talked about briefly, right, uh, yesterday, just that, you know, this combines well with other treatment modalities. So what is very common is that you would use MFR with other techniques, as opposed to it is not as common to like just do MFR for a whole treatment. Sorry, I don't know why there's a word jumble here, but basically uh, it works really well with trigger point release. And we're setting trigger point release, which is often called neuromuscular therapy. That's our next modality. And as I've mentioned several times, once you release the trigger points, it's good to add heat and it's good to add stretching. So this MFR, the reason we learn it before the trigger points is because it's a really good technique after you release the trigger points to stretch them with. And then it basically works well with all these other kind of techniques as well, you know, all kind of different treatment techniques. And uh, you know we will get to trigger point therapy next, so we're, we don't really need to get uh, too into that yet. I, I guess I, I'm kind of passionate. Uh, I was a runner for a long time. I haven't been running uh, in about a year, but you know, in the running community and certain exercise communities, these foam rollers are really popular right now, and they're great for self treatment. Um, but the thing that bothers me about them is there'll be a lot of articles written that will describe massage modalities incorrectly. So they'll like tell people to do myofascial release or trigger point release, and then they will proceed to explain MFR completely wrong. And so whatever they're telling people to do with the rolling instrument is sometimes safe, sometimes not. Um, in any case, it's often not MFR. So these are great tools and they're great tools for a lot of different techniques, including MFR. Uh, but I guess it's all uh, uh, not just me um, randomly on a smoke soapbox, but just kind of information for you too, that you might have clients who are using these tools incorrectly. And so you could do a lot to help educate them to use them safely. So they're not like tearing through their muscle tissue and you know, teaching them how to go slow and warm things up. Um, yeah. And again, we will get to these other techniques later, these muscle energy techniques and other things. Uh, we don't need to go into all the other techniques right now. So uh, a couple more points on this before we move mm -hmm. on. Um, you know, we started talking about this already and some of the questions we're leading in this direction is that we want to assess the whole pattern, right? Like, so an example would be like, you might have a client who just has plantar fasciitis on their foot. You might have a client who has just tennis elbow on their elbow, just neck pain, but those things are never truly just that area, right? There's like always an involvement upstream, downstream, compensation patterns, fascial relationships, synergists and antagonists, right? So we're looking at the whole pattern when we treat it. And, uh, you know, your chapter and the module started talking a little bit about anatomy trains and lines of force, but it's a lot all for one sitting. So we'll actually look at those bigger patterns, including the anatomy trains in the labs where we're specifically releasing them instead of trying to study it all in one go, because it's kind of a lot. But I do want to start to talk about communication regarding MFR, is that first of all, it doesn't feel like a Swedish massage. And so, you know, if your client is, has never had MFR before, and they're just like expecting like a relaxing massage or like a deep tissue massage, uh, it's useful to talk to them about this technique and what it feels like and, you know, kind of your game plan and if they agree to that game plan so that they, um, that they know what to expect and it doesn't feel like, why is my massage therapist just like stretching my skin? Like this doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel some, yeah, yeah, yeah. To some clients, it doesn't feel relaxing exactly. 
to some clients, it doesn't even feel therapeutic. Like some clients will feel like what you're doing and they'll be like, oh my God, I can feel all these connections and I can feel these releases and it feels amazing. And other people will be like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so yeah, also we use very little oil. Uh, we can actually use no oil for this technique, um, but there are ways, like if you were to use other techniques first, there's ways to still do the MFR after. Uh, but we're not applying oil when we do this technique. So a lot of massage therapists will kind of start with the compression and MFR before they get things like slippery. Um, but there are ways to do other warm-up techniques first and then come back to MFR um, just because the MFR works a lot faster if things are warmed up. <clears throat> Do you want to add anything at this point, um, Lucy? Uh, yeah, I just want to share with my experience, like when buy on day one, relaxation like massage, we don't do the technique. But if they want deep tissue massage, we can add the technique before we work like the massage. So that just help a lot for our treatment, improving for clients feels like all oh, everything stuck in their body is can be amazing. Yeah, it's like um the MFR technique is helpful a lot for you when you work on clients and it has improving blood flow. So when it look like the freeway, when it get traffic, everything is blocked. But if we make everything is go through, like we open the freeway, so everything is go through, and then the MFR it look like we open the road for blood flow can go through before we continue for the massage. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah. Uh, question, Anna? Yeah, when we talk about deep tissue massage, this might seem kind of obvious, but um, are we just talking about deep pressure or is there more to a deep tissue massage? Yeah, you know, actually, it's not really an obvious uh, answer either. It's a good question to ask. Um, so the question, because sometimes uh, people can't hear on the recording, is you know, is, is deep deep tissue just deep pressure? Um, you know, it's it's an interesting one to think about. Is that for our clients, that's oftentimes what they think deep tissue is is just deep pressure. Uh, but what deep tissue really is, is like working through the deeper uh, muscles and other structures in the body. So like soleus instead of gastrocnemius, iliopsoas instead of rectus abdominis, um, pec, pec minor instead of pec major, um, subscapularis, those, those deep muscles, rotatories, multifidi, et cetera. Um, but since our clients really think of it as deep pressure, right? It's 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 a conversation. Um, yeah. So some of it, as opposed to just being deep pressure, it's very targeted. Yes. Uh huh. Yep. That's a great way to describe it. Is that it's very targeted. Yep. Um, okay, so I have now moved on to the PowerPoint that's also in the module that. Um, Starts off with chapter two fascia, if you're following along. And I don't wanna like go over stuff that's repetitive, um, but this one gets more into some of the anatomy and then it gets into some of the different types of fascia. Um, So, uh, you know, we've been kind of focusing on this like musculoskeletal fascia, you know, around the muscle tissue. Uh, but do keep in mind that this type of connective tissue also goes around our organs, our nerves, our muscles. And there's even body work modalities developed around these things. So, for example, our nerves, our bigger, our big nerves travel together with arteries and blood vessels or arteries and veins. And they're bundled together with fascia. And what this design does is it helps protect them. So our major nerdery, nerves, arteries, et cetera, they're kind of grouped like a cable. And that cable is wrapped in fascia. And so there's even modalities that work with the nerves themselves 
and their flexibility because they can get kind of, you know, pulled out of whack. Well, like those allergies for frogs? Uh, nerve, I forget the name that comes after it, uh, unwinding. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then organs as well, um, you know, the fascia that goes around the organs, like there's a visceral manipulation is a technique that works with that in your abdominal area. That's a kind of more advanced study. Um, so there, there are other types of fascia, um, but we wanna think about this um, fascia as this three dimensional matrix that really connects everything. Um, it provides uh, shock absorption and structure. And it's also um, helps uh, provide like a communication network and the movement of nutrients. You can divide the fascia into superficial, which is the subcutaneous fascia, the fascia. <laughs> So when we study the integumentary system, that's our sub, sub Q or subcutaneous. The deep fascia is called the myofascia covering the muscles and then the visceral fascia around organs. Now the basic composition of fascia and you could expect to see this on your licensing uh, exam test is to understand that there's this ground substance that has like a, a, a gel kind of substance as the base. And this is kind of the fluid matrix that helps support everything and is vital for communication. In that, we have a lot of proteins which are very flexible, like our collagen and elastin. We also have integrins, which are receptors that detect compression and tension. So we actually do have sensory abilities with our fascia. And here's kind of where we get a little, I think we should probably take a mental break before we get into this kind of like consegrity model, myofascial lines, et cetera. So I think we should come back to this on another day when we start working with these lines specifically. And uh, for today, focus more on our, um, starting to get some basic techniques in our hands. Um, I'm gonna pause it before I ask you a question. <clears throat> 